Hiya folks. In the last few days, Spring Boot 2.7, which came with it, Spring GraphQL 1.0, was released. So I thought I'd take this moment to show you how to build an API and how to consume an API using Spring GraphQL. Before we start working with GraphQL, let's take a look at a non-GraphQL API, just something built using Spring MVC, just a standard Spring REST API. I've already built it. I didn't want to build that in the course of this video, so I went ahead and built it up front. And you can see we have a basic Spring MVC REST controller. It takes requests uh, who are rooted with a path of books, and specifically it takes a Git mapping that returns all the books and a post mapping which will save a book. It does this by working through the book repository which is just a Spring Data repository. Specifically I am using Spring Data JPA although it could have been any of the Spring Data projects and this book repository extends CRUD repository so that I can do CRUD operations such as find all and save on a for books. And here is my book entity. It's just annotated with good old-fashioned JPA entity uh, ID generated value and it has a many to one over to an author. An author has just a first name, last name, and of course a generated ID. Okay, let's just kick the tires on it and see, see what happens. Just see if it even works. And I'm gonna pull this window over while it's running and I'm gonna say curl localhost 8080 slash books and I'm going to get a list of books. Now it's a little, it's formatted a little weird, so I could pipe it to JQ and you see it a little bit easier to read. And you see we have two books in there, Knitting with Dog Hair by Kendall Crolius and Crafting with Cat Hair by K.R.E. Sutaya. Now, before anybody uh, chuckles at this, I mean, it is kind of funny, but these are real books. Those are in fact the real ISBNs for those books. So uh, check them out. Uh, they are available on Amazon as well as other places, but that's not really the point of this video. What I want to show you is how to build a GraphQL API instead of a REST API and why that would benefit you. So let's think about this a minute. What if, move this out of the way, what if as an API client author, I wanted to consume not just all the books and not just to be able to save a book, but I also wanted to be able to maybe query, the, uh, query a book by its ISBN or query a book by its author's name or something like that. Well, in order to support that scenario, I would have to add a few things. So for example, if I were to query by ISBN, I would have to come over here to my book repository and I would have to add a method find by ISBN. And then I would have to come over here into my REST controller and add another Git mapping that calls into that find by ISBN method on the book repository. I mean, I could do that, I could certainly do it. And then now the client author also wants to find books by their author. So I would have to come over here to book repository and I would have to add a, another method, find by author. And then I would have to come over to my controller and add another Git mapping that looks for books by their author using that, that new method in the book repository. Now the good news is we don't have to implement that method. That's what Spring Data is really good about is implementing it for us at, at runtime. But we would still have to declare it in the repository. We'd have to still have to create create the uh, handler method in the in the controller. And after a while, this gets a little bit tedious. Now I'm, I have a very simple domain, but after a while, you might consider uh, a client who's wanting to do several things with books. And for each one of those things that we want our client to be able to do, the API author has to go add the appropriate handler methods in the controller and the appropriate. Uh, method declarations in the repository. And it's not a hard thing to do, but it's basically at the mercy of the API designer to add what's needed. And even then, let's take another look again at that request when I did get all the books. Notice I got everything about the book. I got the database specific ID, I got the ISBN, I got the title, I got the author as a subfield, including its database specific ID, and the first name and the last name. Now maybe as a API client, I really don't care about the author's name. Maybe all I need is the ISBN and the title. And maybe I don't even wanna see or should see 
the database specific ID. So how do I keep that out of the response? Now there are things I could do on the server to, to keep those, those details out of the response and there are things I could do on the server side, on the API side, to enable the client to ask for specific fields or to make a different query where it only gives them what you know a subset of the fields. You, these, these can be done with things like projections and, and whatnot. But again, it's up to the API designer to support that. And right now, this API does not support asking for a subset of the fields in any form whatsoever. And it also does not support asking for um, the, the book without any of the database-specific IDs. It would be up to the API designer to go create those methods, those handler methods in the controller and the appropriate repository methods to support that. So, with that said, let's see how GraphQL can help with that. But before we even go that far, let's start off with what is required by most presentations, and that is a Hello World example of Graph a GraphQL. Okay. In order to add GraphQL to this project, we have to start by adding the appropriate starter dependencies to our POM. So I'm going to go over into my POM file. I'm going to use the facilities offered by the IDE to allow me to add Spring GraphQL. That's all I really need to do at this point. So I've added it to the POM file. I'm going to say finish. And now it's in the project. So the very next thing I need to do is to find a GraphQL schema. And to do that, we're going to create a folder at the root of the class path under source main resources. We'll call it GraphQL, which is the name you're supposed to call it. It's going to look for the schema in here, and specifically, um, it's going to look for a file called schema.graphql and then an S for schema. In there, I'm going to create a type. Now, there's different things you can create in a schema. You can define queries, you can define mutations, you can define inputs, you can define, uh, you know, types that are, you might return. I'm just going to define a very simple query. I'm going to name it hello and it is going to return a string. Now that exclamation mark on the end, that is an indicator that uh, in this schema to say hey whatever this query does it needs to return a string. It can't return null. It must return a non-null string value. Which is not a problem because the way I'm going to write my controller in a moment is going to ensure that it does in fact return a string value. But that's what an exclamation mark means when you see it in a query or in a in a GraphQL schema is that the thing that you're exclamation marking is required. Specifically I'm creating a query called hello that's going to return string. Now to support that, to make that work, we need to create a new class, a new controller class. So I'm going to create a new class. We're going to call it hello graph QL controller. I'm going to annotate it as a controller. Now you could annotate it as rest controller if you want. It would still work, but it's kind of lying in that case. It's not going to be really a rest controller. It's going to be just a standard controller. And normally in a controller you would put things like request mappings or get mappings or post mappings or things like that. No, that's not what I'm going to do. This is a GraphQL controller and it's going to handle queries, so I'm going to put a query mapping annotation. And the specific query I'm going to handle is named hello. Then I'm just going to return a string. Hello GraphQL. There. That's what I'm returning. And that is my controller. Now you notice query mapping is very similar to git mapping. Uh, but instead of responding to a path on an HTTP request, it is responding to a query that is passed called hello. And it's going to return the string hello GraphQL. Great. So it looks like it's everything's been restarted, but I did add a new dependency, so I do need to restart it the hard way. I don't I can't just rely on DevTools to do that for me. And also it looks like I did not save the, the schema, so I might as well do that while we're here. And now that that's done, let's bring our console window over again. And I'm going to say curl localhost 8080 slash GraphQL. Now here's the thing, every GraphQL query that you post will go to this endpoint, GraphQL. It's always the same path. And more specifically, I did use the word post 
all requests to a GraphQL endpoint are post request, HTTP post request. Now that's probably going to cause some heartburn in those of you who are very much strict REST uh, people and really think about you know the verbs and what the HTTP verbs mean and whether you're getting versus posting versus putting versus deleting. I'm not going to worry about that right now. I'll let you uh, have nightmares about that if that's a problem you have. But it's always going to be a post and because I'm using curl I need to tell it what the content type I'm, I'm posting is. So I'm going to say application slash JSON and then I'm going to finally pass in the query. And the query itself takes the form of a JSON document that has a property named query and whose value is the query itself which itself the query itself has a kind of a curly brace not exactly JSON but a curly brace style structure and I'm gonna just give it the query name hello and look we got some data back the data the the structure of that JSON we got back is data and then within that we have the name uh, a property whose name is the name of the query and then the value of that property is the results of the query itself. Now, that was a little bit more typing than I care to do with curl, and so I'm not a big fan of curl when it comes to dealing with JSON um, inputs and outputs. I prefer another tool called HTTPIE. You can find it at HTTPIE.org, or no, I'm sorry, HTTPIE.io. But I'm going to show you how to do it with that, and that's probably what I'm going to use for a good chunk of the uh, queries we do during the rest of this video. So HTTP 8080, it, it assumes localhost. GraphQL, it's also going to assume that both the inputs and the outputs are JSON. And I'm going to specifically set a create a JSON document or post a JSON document where the query property is equal to my GraphQL query. And that gives me the same results back, a little bit nicer formatted. But I just wanted to show you both ways of doing it in case you're a big curl fanatic. That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is using HTTPIE, which is a lot simpler because it assumes things like localhost and that we're working with JSON. Okay, now, now that I've shown you the Hello World example, let's take a step, step back, go back to the books example and see how to create GraphQL queries to work with our books collection. All right, let's go ahead and add a new query to our GraphQL schema to deal with books. And it's gonna be very simple. We're gonna have a query whose name is books and we're expecting to return a collection or a list or an array of book. Now, at this point we have a type in our schema that GraphQL doesn't know about. So we have to go to actually define the book type. So it's kind of done the same way as the query and the book type is going to have in it ISBN that's going to be a string it's going to have title which is also a string and it's going to have an author which is an author now at this point what I'm doing is I'm as a as an API designer I am deciding what the client can possibly ask for when it when working with books they can they they can ask for and receive an ISBN a title and an author I could leave author out, in which case the only thing they could possibly get is an ISBN and title. The schema decides what is available. And if there were other properties, I could choose to leave them in or take them out. But for, this, for the purposes of this example, I'm just going to include all three properties, ISBN, title, and author. Now, here we are again with another type that GraphQL doesn't know about, author, so we have to go define one of those as well. And author is a fairly simple type. It's going to have two properties, first name which is a string and last name also a string and the rules are that those can't be null alright so there we go I've just defined my query now before I can go any further I need to go make a slight tweak to my book repository two things in fact first thing I need to do is I need to annotate it as a GraphQL repository this is indicating that this can can work this spring data repository can work along with Spring GraphQL to produce results. And you're going to see the benefit of it in just a moment. 
but before I can show you, I need to also have make sure it not only extends CRUD repository, but also extends one of two possible executors. There's query DSL executor and query by example executor. I find query by example executor to be the simplest and, for, and, and it works for pretty much every example that I've ever needed to do. So I'm going to use query by example executor and it's of type book. Now this this is not a query by example executor is not a has any has nothing really to do with GraphQL other than GraphQL is going to use it. You can use it yourself if you want. It's a feature of Spring Data itself. So you could use it. But I'm not going to. I don't need to do that. I'm going to leave that alone. And there we go. We have everything I think we need to make this work. So we're a GraphQL repository. We extend both CRUD repository of course, but also Query by Example Executor, and our schema has a new query called Books that returns a book. Book itself has an author, and authors are defined with these two strings. So there we go. I think we have everything we need. Let's give it a shot. Let's pull that console window back over, and we're going to say HTTP 8080 slash GraphQL query equal books. Now, I'm going to do it very much like I did with hello. I'm just going to say books. That's the name of the query, right? But I'm going to get an error. It's saying validation error of type subselection required. Basically what it's saying is I've asked for books, but I didn't tell it what I want as a book. Now this is kind of an important feature, an important factor of what GraphQL enables is while the API designer decided that you could ask for ISBN title and author when you're asking for a book, the API client still has a choice. They don't have to receive everything. So they, they can specify what they do want. And let's just say, for the sake of argument, all they want is the ISBN in the title. And look, there we go. We got our response back. Our response has a data field, which itself has a books field. The books is the name of the query we just executed. And then the value of books is the array or the list of books that were returned. And because I only asked for ISBN and title, that's all I got. But let's just say I wanted author as well. I changed my mind. I do want author. Well, we're back to that sub-selection error. And the reason is we didn't tell it what fields of author we want. So I could ask for just the author's last name if I wanted. In which case, here I got author with the last name of Crolius and Sutaya for each of the books. Or if I really wanted to, as a API client, I could ask for both names. But again, I'm in control. You can kind of think of this as being slightly analogous to how SQL works. The database designer, the schema designer of the, of the database has decided what tables and what columns are available in the database. But as a SQL client, as a someone who's going to query that database, I still have the choice of selecting what columns I want. I don't have to say select star on all the tables, I can select specifically which fields I'm interested in. Same thing here. The API designer has decided what's available, but the API client gets to decide what they want out of that, out of what is available. They can either ask for a subset or, as I've done in this last query, ask for everything. It's up to the API client to make that decision. Now let's extend it. Let's talk about what I said before. What if we wanted to add a by ISBN query? We simply want to add a by ISBN. Now before, with REST controller, we would have had to add uh, a new handler method in the REST controller, and we would have had to go visit our book repository to add a find by ISBN method. Well, with query, I'm sorry, with graph D DSL, it's actually a little bit easier. I can create a query called by ISBN. I'm going to take as an argument the ISBN, and it can't be null. It's going to be a string, and it can't be null and I'm going to return a book. Now, because ISBN is a considered a unique identifier for a book, I only need to return a single book. I don't need to return a an array of books. But with that said, let's just save that. Spring DevTools has already restarted the app for me, so let's give that a spin. Let's back up here. Let's get rid of the author out of the response. We still need to define what we want from book, but instead of saying give me all books. I'm going to say give me books by their ISBN and specifically where the ISBN is equal to and I'm just going to pick on the crafting with cat hair book. I'm going to give it that one's ISBN. 
and you see we got that. Now if I wanted the dog hair book, that would have also worked, of course. I just have to go change out the ISBN in the query. So you can kind of think of this as being analogous to a where clause in an SQL statement, although it's not an SQL statement at all, it is a GraphQL query. But it's roughly analogous to that. So there you go, we just added that. That was pretty cool. How about we extend it with a find by author while we're at it? Let's just see what that would look like. All right, so a couple things I need to do. I need to go and create a new query. We're gonna say by author. We're gonna take an author as input. Now here's the thing, we can't use this here because anything that goes into a query as a parameter such as ISBN has to be of type input and this is not an input type. So I have to create a new type that's very similar to author but I'm going to call it author in and it's going to return a collection of books because an author could have multiple books potentially. So now I need to go create my inputs. So input author in and it looks a little bit like what we already have, so I'm just going to go ahead and copy and paste those. Now, I am going to do one small thing different. I am not going to make these required, and you'll see why here in a moment. All right, so there, we have what we need. Let's go give it a spin. Let's pull our window back up. First off, indeed, our query by ISBN still works. Let's go query by author. So, by author, and what we're going to pass into author is first name. Kendall, last name, Crolius, and who made a mistake? Unknown field, last name, by author. Okay. Um, oh, it's because I didn't. Pa I, I did it wrong. I, I formatted the the query incorrectly. What I needed to do is I needed to not do that. That would have worked had I taken two strings called first name and last name as arguments. But instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an author and that is going to have a first name of um, Kendall and a last name of Crolius. And there I got what I needed. Now here's why I did not make first name and last name required. Because maybe all I want are all the books by authors whose last name is Crolius, and that will also work. Or maybe I want all the ones whose first name is Kaori. Oops. And by not making those fields required, by not making first name and last name required, I'm able to pass in just one or the other if I want and get books that match that. So, so far so good. Great, that worked. Let me show you a, a little bit easier way of working with this because as, as you can see, working with it, even, even though it's not curl, still working with HTTP IE gets a little bit cumbersome once the queries get a little bit more interesting. So I'm going to show you another way you could test this and poke around at your API. A thing called GraphQL or graphical if you want to pronounce it that way. One. All right. Graphical or GraphEQL, depending on how you want to pronounce it. I'm sure there's a correct pronunciation. I just call it GraphEQL or graphical, depending on how I feel. But GraphEQL is actually very easy to add to your project. Just go to the POM file. And unfortunately, at least when I'm, at the time I'm creating this video, it does not exist as a checkbox or even as a, uh, as a managed version in the Spring Boot, the uh, start.spring.io or the Spring Boot. Uh, dependency management. So I do have to go add it kind of manually. I'm going to say dependency. It is going to be group ID of com.graphql java and then artifact ID is going to be graphql, not graphql, but graphql spring boot starter, which means it's going to have all the uh, auto configuration that you would expect from a starter. It, all I have to do is add the dependency and it should just work. But I do have to specify a version because again, um, at this point anyway, Spring Boot's dependency management uh, master, uh, I'm sorry, parent dependency does not define a version for this. So I have to go specify the version. But now that I've added that, 
I am going to restart my app. I'm not going to rely on DevTools to, to do that because I did make a change. I'm going to restart my app and I'm going to pull up a browser. I'm going to go to localhost 8080 GraphEQL. And you can see I've done this before. This is not my first time playing with it. So there's some history in here of the different queries I may have done in the past. Let's give this a shot. Let's try this with our Hello World example. So just a query of hello. I'm going to run it. And you can see we got a response over here on the right. I'll bump that font up a little bit bigger. I'm going to do the same thing with our books. I can say for books, and I want ISBN. And you can't see it because that pop-up happened, but I get a little bit of code completion even. You can see it helps me a little bit with that title, and it's going to give me that. I could even ask for author. And with author, I can ask for first name, last name. I can prettify it if I want to, to make it a little bit easier to read. Still works, of course. And that is GraphQL. Just wanted to show you that before we go any further because the things we're about to do are a little bit trickier to do with the command line. Okay, up till now we've used GraphQL to query for books or even, you know, custom implementations of queries using like the hello query. Um, but querying for data is only is only part of the problem. What if we want to change the data? What if we want to actually create a new book or delete a book or update a book or anything anything like that that might actually mutate some of the data in the back? Well, that's where GraphQL mutations come in handy. So Mutations are kind of like queries, uh, but they're the other way around, where queries pull stuff out, mutations send stuff in, and then possibly pull stuff out as a response. So let's go define a query for adding a book. Or, I'm sorry, a mutation for adding a book. So very much like we defined our query, we create a type, we call it mutation. And any mutation you want to put is going to fall under this, this type called mutation. And the mutation specifically that we're interested in, we're going to call it add book. It's going to take as an argument a book, and that book has to be an input. We can't use this type again, much like we couldn't use author in when we queried by author. We can't use book as an input for, for book. We have to create a new book in type. But what we'll respond with will be the book that we saved. So let's go create our our book input. We'll do it right here just before author in. So input book in. It is going to have basically the three fields you would expect it to have. ISBN required string, title required string, and author. Well, it's going to be required. We can reuse our already existing author in. Now you could argue that maybe at this point we should make those strings required for the purposes of saving a new book. And if you did that, then of course you would break your by author query so that it can't support so, uh, searching for authors by only first name or only last name. So maybe then what we would argue is that maybe we create a whole other input that is uh, does require everything. Um, but you know, for the sake of discussion, I am only going to just say we require author in. We're going to leave these as not being uh, required for that author in. Okay, great. We've just added it. Now here's the thing. If we went and tried this right now, it would appear to work, but it wouldn't actually do anything. It wouldn't respond with anything useful, and it would not, in fact, it would respond with a null for the book that, we re, that it returns because there's nothing that implements this. Whereas Spring Data and using the query by example executor was and the, the fact that it was our repository was annotated with GraphQL repository, Spring Data and GraphQL were able to work together to sort of magically implement these queries that we did for books by ISBN, by author, and whatnot. But for mutations, we need to help it a little bit. So much the same way that we created a book, where did we put it? I'm sorry, a hello GraphQL controller to deal with our own custom query mapping, we're going to create another controller, and we're going to call it books GraphQL controller. And in our books at GraphQL controller, which is going to be just a controller like we did before, we are going to define a mutation mapping. Obviously, the mutation mappings are like query mappings, but 
therefore mutations. And the name we're going to give it is add book because that matches our query. We're going to have a add book method that returns a book and takes as an argument which is very similar to Spring MVC and Spring Webflux's request body annotation. It's very similar to the request body, but it's a little different because we're not necessarily pulling anything from the request body. We are asking for the argument, and the name of the argument we want is going to be book. Now, this is going to be important. We need to remember this later. Otherwise, our query won't work quite right, or our mutation when we submit it won't work quite right. But nevertheless, there is our argument. It's going to take a book as book in. Now here's the where I can reuse stuff that we had done before. Before we used book as an output type, but in Java we can also use book as an input type if we want because as it turns out, even though we couldn't define a book the same way as, a, as, as both a, we couldn't use the type, the book type in our schema to also serve as an input, in Java we can because the fields are going to be pretty much the same. So we can get away with it here. I'm going to go ahead and import that argument annotation so the warning goes away. Nevertheless, we're going to take our book in, and what we're going to do is we're going to save it somehow, but we, we have to have stuff to save it with, so I need to go ahead and create properties for this. Uh, I'm going to say book graphql controller. We're going to take as an argument our book repository, book repo. We're going to take our author repository, author repo. We're going to assign those to instance variables. There we go. And then down here, here's what I'm going to do. Now, because a, an author could author multiple books, I don't want to just simply save the author to the author repo every time a book comes in. Otherwise, I may end up with multiple authors that are really the same author. Imagine if we tried to add all of the, the books in, that Stephen King has written. There would be dozens of authors all with the name Stephen and King and we don't want to do that. It's all the same author, we're going to keep using the same author. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say author repo dot find one or not find one, find by ID. Actually that's not what I want to do either. I did want to do find one but here here's the thing I don't have a find one method. Here's why. Let me show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come over here to the author repository and even though I'm not going to make it a GraphQL repository, I am going to take advantage of what query by example executor can do for me and have it return an author by an example. That's going to allow me to do over here in my controller, I'm going to say find one and I have to give it an example book. So I'm going to say example of whatever the book ends author is. So basically take whatever the author is, whatever values it has in there, and we're going to use that as our example to do a find one. We're going to query by this example. If both the author's first name and last name are specified, then we're going to find any author who has first name and last name of whatever they are. If neither one, if only one of them is specified, we're going to find all the examples where only that one is specified. The, the null field will be ignored. That's kind of how the example query executor find by or find one works. Now we if if we find it. If it does in fact exist, then we are going to do this. We're going to say author, and we're going to do something. If it doesn't exist, we're going to do something else. Okay. I'm going to put a few spaces in there for readability's sake. I'm going to also come down to another line for these things just so that they don't get all jumbled up on one line. And what I'm going to say is if we did find an author, that's great. Then what we're going to do is we're going to say book in, we're going to set that author to the author we found and essentially replacing the one that was passed in. And the reason for that is the author that we were given uh, doesn't know the ID and therefore that's what would result in creating a new one. The author that we found does have an ID so it's going to just reuse the one that's already in the database. Now if we didn't find it then what we're going to do is we're going to simply say author repo save book in get author. We're going to save it with the one that was given to us. And then finally now that we have all that and apparently I have an error somewhere probably probably that semicolon that's missing. There we go. If all that works now we're just going to say book repo save our book in. 
Fantastic. Now we have our repository. Um, I'm sorry, now we have our mutation mapping defined. We're going to try to save a book. If we can, we're going to reuse an author that has the same first name and last name as before. If we can't, we're going to save the author and then we're going to save the book with that author. Perfect. Meanwhile, over in our schema, we have defined the mutation as taking as called add book to taking a book in as an argument and returning a book. Book in looks just like a book. The only difference really is that it is an input. It's not it's not just a standard type. All right, now that we've created all that, let's give this a shot over in graphical. All right, so here we go. Now, the first thing we're going to do is type mutation. That's going to be a clue to us that we're about to do a mutation. Incidentally, when we ever did queries before, when we said like hello, th this is actually shorthand for this. Those mean the same thing. It's just if you leave off what it is, it's going to assume that it's a query. But we're not going to do a query, we're going to do a mutation. And specifically, the mutation we're going to do is add book. And the book we're going to add, we have to call it book. Now, this is the important part. Remember, we called our argument book. Whatever you put here has to match whatever the argument name is. So this name here matches this name here. If you don't do that, it's not going to work. So there we go. I'm going to take our book, and our book is going to have in it, it's going to have an ISBN of, I never can remember ISBN, so I'm just going to put in about 10 characters. And I'm going to say the title is Spring in Action sixth edition. I hear this is a good book. You should check it out. And author is Craig Walls. Well, author can't be Craig Walls. That's not going to work. That's a string. That's not a string. It needs to be its own thing. It's going to be first name Craig, last name Walls. Now, really quick, uh, just point out kind of an important detail. I almost made a mistake as I was typing all that. You, you don't need to put commas in here. In fact, I, I don't think it'll work if you do put commas. Just spaces between each one of these is just fine. Well, now that we've defined our add book, we've said what we're going to pass into it, we now have to tell it what we want back from it. What do we want back? Well, let's just say we just want the, the ISBN and the title. All right, I think that's a lot of typing, but I think I got that right. Let's give it a spin. And it looks like it added it. It didn't complain. It shows the uh, the results I was looking for. And now let's go ask for our um, let's go ask for books. So books, and we want ISBN, title, author, and for author we want first name and last name. Let's try that. And now you can see we got knitting with dog hair, we got crafting with cat hair, and we have spring in action sixth edition. Great. Let's try that one more time. Let's try that mutation one more time. I'm going to go over here and change it such that it has a different ISBN. It's going to have a different title as well because it's a different book we're adding. I'm going to add another book that I hear is really good. Build Talking Apps for Alexa. I don't have to change the author name. Turns out it's the same author for that book. You might want to check that one out as well. And we're going to say go. And look, it just added it. it says it added it. Let's go make that query again and see if it in fact comes back in the response. And as you can see, it does. Knitting with dog hair, crafting with cat hair, spring in action sixth edition, and build talking apps for Alexa. We have just added mutation support. And so if we wanted to add delete, I won't bother going through the effort of doing that, but if we wanted to delete a book, we could certainly add a mutation mapping that takes some argument, either the book itself or maybe the ID of a book or the ISBN of a book, however we want to identify it and then inside of there just simply delete it. We could do that as well. And with that said, let's let's build a client for this. I've been using uh, GraphQL, I've been using curl, I've been using HTTP IE. Let's actually build a client for this API. All right. In addition to creating APIs with Spring GraphQL, another thing you can do is create clients that consume those APIs. Now, of course, just like I was using curl and HTTPI, which neither one of which are GraphQL clients, 
they are technically HTTP clients and they work fine with that, you could use any HTTP client to consume your GraphQL API. But it would be kind of on you to kind of structure that, that query. It would be kind of on you to uh, go extract the data out from under the data and then whatever the query name is to get the, the results you want. It would be kind of on you to do all that. You could certainly use REST template. You could use web client if you want, and you wouldn't have to uh, use Spring GraphQL's own client. You could, you could use whatever you want. However, if you are using Spring GraphQL's client, there's some some conveniences you're going to get out of it as you're about to see. So I've gone ahead and started the project. I've had the I've put the appropriate dependencies in there to get GraphQL in there, and um, I'm just going to go ahead and go into the the client application, the the main class in here, and I'm going to create a bean of type application runner now. You could use any. You could you could actually use the GraphQL client anywhere in your application. I want. I'm choosing to use it in Application Runner because it's just a convenient place for me to to put executable stuff. So I'm gonna say I'm gonna say go. I'm gonna say return our args, and we're gonna do something in there. If you're not familiar with Application Runner, essentially any bean of type Application Runner or any bean of type command line runner are going to be executed with the arguments from the command line. They're going to be executed after the application context has been created, but before pretty much anything else happens. So this is essentially the main method of my Spring application. This is the main method of the Java application, but at this point the Spring application context hasn't been created. By the time we get down here, Spring application context has been created, everything's in place, and we're ready to go. So here's what we're going to do. In here, I'm going to say, I'm going to create an HTTP GraphQL client and the way I'm going to do that is using a builder which is very convenient and that builder is going to ask me to set a web client on it now this is the same web client that came along with Spring Web Flux it is the exact same web client so the best way to set it there's a couple of ways I think to set it no, no only one it's just a consumer uh, the best way to set it is to say web client is going to give me a builder and in there with that builder, I'm going to say builder .base URL, and I'm going to pass it HTTP localhost. Uh, helps if I could type HTTP colon slash slash localhost 8080 slash GraphQL, which, as you'll recall, is where my application, my API created before, is listening. So there, I'm using that builder, and then I'm going to say build, and whatever I get back is going to be my QL client. Okay. Now with that QL client, I'm going to ask it to basically execute this document, which could be a query, it could be a mutation, uh, but specifically, I'm going to give it my hello example. Just just to keep it simple. I say hello. Do the hello query. And with that, what am I going to do with it? Well, I'm going to retrieve from that. The response is going to come back with data. And under data, there'll be books. I'm not, not sorry, not books. Hello. And under hello is going to be the string I really care about. So I have to tell it, okay, retrieve the hello response, basically the name of the query, retrieve that. I'm going to map it to an entity of type string, because that's all it is, it's just a string anyway. And I'm going to say do on next, because what's happening here is this is returning a flux. And so on that flux, I'm going to say do on next. I'm going to take whatever string came back and I'm just going to sys out it. Just really simple. So response was whatever the S is. Great. Now, because this is returning a flux and because fluxes don't do anything until somebody subscribes to them, I need to subscribe to it. Okay, great. Now that we've got that, I need to do one more thing because here's what's going to happen. If I'm not careful, in fact, it probably is not. It's not a matter of me being careful at all. It, it comes a matter of timing. This main thread that the application runner is running in, this will complete before that query comes back with a response. As a consequence, if I were to run it right now, their odds are really good I won't see any output. So I need to do something to kind of keep this main thread alive. And there's a lot of ways I could do that. Probably the, just the most straightforward forward way of doing it is just say thread.sleep maybe make it sleep five seconds, which is probably way more than enough time for what I need it to do. 
and I have to catch an exception just because I have to catch an exception. Okay, there we go. Now let's give it a spin. You can see over here in my boot dashboard, my API is still running from before. So I'm just going to run QL client and you're going to see, there it is. Response, hello GraphQL. It worked. Fantastic. And all we did is we create, used the builder to create our HTTP GraphQL client. We gave it, we, we, it gave us a web client builder on which we told it where the base URL was. We told it what query we wanted to execute. We told it what we wanted to fetch from the response. We wanted, told it what we wanted to mount that to or bind that to. And then we said, here's what we're gonna do with that. It's gonna give us a flux back. Here's what we're gonna do with it. We're gonna sys out the response. Great. So now, with that said, let's tweak this a little bit more and have it do something else. Let's go ask it for books. Now I could I could give it any one of the queries we've done in this entire video. I'm just going to again just for the sake of discussion keep this very simple and I'm going to just ask for the simple books example. The books query. I could do books by ISBN. I could do by author if I wanted to. But I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to say books. And books is going to take it's going to give me an ISBN and it's going to give me a title. I'm not going to worry about the author for this example. Now, for that to work, I need to retrieve it from books, because again, that's the name of the query, and that is the property that's under data in the response. And I need to say to entity list, which is a really weird method in my opinion. It seems like I, I wish it would not give me a list. I wish it would actually give me a flux from this, but regardless, it's going to get all the books back. It's going to put them into this entity list, and I need to give it something to put it into. I need to give it a book. To, to work with, but this this project, this is a brand new project, it doesn't have a book type. So I'm gonna go add that book type real quick. And in this case, because I'm not doing anything JPA-ish with it, I don't need to do anything very special with it, it'll work fine as a Java record. So I'm gonna say public book record, or public record book, I'm gonna take string, ISBN, string, title. And because I don't have an author, I'm not worried about author at this point, I can kind of leave that out. I can come back over here, and you're gonna see that that's happy now. Uh, it's happy that I gave it a book to work with. I'm going to say do on next and that's going to give me a book list on which I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something with that list. What am I going to do? I'm going to say book list for each. I'm going to take the book I'm given and I'm just going to sys out its information. So sys out book book now let's see what happens run it again we should get hello and we should get our list of books it apparently did not work oh obviously obvious reason why I did not subscribe to the flux it's coming out of that. Is it is it flux or am I, nope I was wrong it's a mono uh, regardless I had not subscribed to it let's run it again and now you're going to see Hello GraphQL, and we're going to see each one of the books that it was able to pull from that API. Great. So now, as you can see, we can use the QL client to make any query we want against our GraphQL API. You could also use this for mutations if I wanted to. You could use this for queries. You could use it however you see fit. The benefit of QL client, once again, being I don't have to dig around in the response myself, it'll dig around in the response for me. One other thing on the GraphQL client before we let it go. I'm going to go over here in my source main resources. Now this again being a new project, it's going to be a little bit different. It doesn't, it doesn't yet have a GraphQL folder in it, so I'm going to add a GraphQL folder. And in that GraphQL folder, I'm going to add a file called books dot GraphQL and in that books GraphQL I'm going to just say books ISBN title. I've basically defined my query in an external GraphQL file. That What that's going to allow me to do is come back over to my client and instead of saying document and giving it the query right there I can just give it the name books and just change this method from being document to being document name. And now when I run it, 
it doesn't work. What did I do wrong? I probably mis misstructured something. Failed to find document name books under location GraphQL documents. Oh, that's what I need to do. I need to rename that. I thought it was I thought it was supposed to go under GraphQL. Apparently it needs to go under GraphQL documents. I wonder if that's changed because I sort of remember it being another way before. Let's give that another shot. And there you see it worked. So yes. I, instead of actually specifying the query here, I specified the query externally under GraphQL documents as a file called books GraphQL. And then I told it to do basically everything it did before as if I was specifying the query directly right here. Okay, I hope you enjoyed what I've, I've shown you here today. In this video, we started by examining a simple Spring REST API and talking about what it would take to expand that, to extend it to support other types of queries. Then we built a simple Hello World GraphQL API. We expanded on that by creating a Books API and showing how, as compared to the REST API equivalent of that, a GraphQL API is far more flexible, both in terms of the developer who's developing the API as well as the developer who's consuming the API. The API designer gets to decide what the client gets to see. The client gets to decide what they want to see. And both, it's a give and take, both get a chance to have a say in what kind of data they're working with. Then we looked at Graphical, which is a interesting little web-based query tool. We saw how to create mutations to change data, to pass data into a GraphQL API. And then finally, we saw how to use GraphQL, Spring GraphQL's client library, to make easy work of consuming an API from a Spring application. So again, I sure hope you enjoyed this. If you did, uh, be sure and mention it on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook or wherever you like to uh, tell people about things you've just learned. And by all means, check out my books. Spring in Action, the sixth edition, now in print, uh, covers some of the stuff we talked about in here. Unfortunately, GraphQL was still really new. Again, it was just 1.0 GA just in the last few days. So it wasn't, that's not covered in the book. Uh, but a lot of the other things behind the scenes we talked about, things like the Spring Data stuff, that is covered in the book. And also check out my other book, Building Voice Apps for Alexa. That is a fantastic and fun opportunity to create a new form of user interface that's hands-free and uses your voice. With that, thank you very much, and uh, see you next time.